Okay, this time around, what we want to talk about, we talked about Enoch this morning, uh, the book of Enoch, and the prophecies in there. But I want to bring up uh, some of the early church fathers and see what they taught. And it's really interesting, again, to, to see this. And let me give you a little bit of information. Are we... Is it not showing the slide? Yay, all right. You never know when I hit a button. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, just to give you some ideas behind this. Now, this is really interesting to me because I always wanted to, to talk to or read about the early church fathers that were disciples of the apostles. So somebody that would say, well, what about eternal security? What about the gifts of the Spirit? What about prophecy? What about this? All the things we wonder about. And to have somebody say, yeah, I was wondering about that myself, so I went and asked John last night. We talked about it over dinner. Oh, wouldn't that be great, you know? There are some records like that, or at least my grandfather knew, knew John the Apostle. So just to introduce you to some of these guys, uh, it's pretty interesting. The guy in the middle, and actually I just kind of do that. Those are uh, stained glass statues from different cathedrals. You know, nobody knows what these guys really look like. But uh, the guy in the middle is, is uh, Irenaeus, and he has a really interesting testimony. He, he was a bishop in France. You know, and of course, uh, the France church was a plant from Rome, uh, much like other places were plants from other different patriarchates. But uh, it's at the time when we have what we call Pope Victor, you know, was ruling from Rome. And Irenaeus is an interesting guy because there is a section in one of his writings where Pope Victor is beginning to say, well, baptism is really different. We should do it differently. And he was getting to the point where it was somewhat heretical. If you were baptized as a heretic, yeah, it's okay, we're just going to allow that. And Irenaeus stands up and says, no, we don't rebaptize people, but if you were baptized as a Buddhist, you need to be baptized as a Christian. That, no, uh-uh. And so he actually writes to Pope Victor and says, look, I'm an old man. I can hardly remember what I ate for breakfast this morning, okay? But the stuff I did as a kid is crystal clear. I can tell you stories of when we used to set out in the park under the trees and talk about the, the scriptures. And I got to study for a long time under Polycarp. Polycarp's a disciple of John. And occasionally, this really old guy, the Apostle John, would come out, you know, summertime when the weather's right. And I would get to talk to him and verify what Polycarp told me. Now I'm going to tell you something. If John was here and heard you say what you just said, he would clap his hands together and say, oh, God, why did you leave, let me live long enough to see such rank heresy in the church? And he would turn around, he'd walk out, and he would never speak to you again, Mr. Pope. You know, of course, they didn't call themselves popes at the time, but it just kind of shows you the whole concept. You know, it, it's, it doesn't matter whose chair you're sitting in. Do you teach what they taught? That's all we care about. So he was a, an amazing guy in that way. So we've got John, the apostle, and he's teaching, and he's banished to the Isle of Patmos in around 95. He writes the book of Revelation, and then the Caesar that banished all the Christians died. The new Caesar says they're goofy, but I don't see a problem with them. Let's them go. So John goes back to, the, uh, to Ephesus, where he used that as a missionary outreach to go plant churches. He'd take a year or two, go plant a church, get it going, go somewhere else, plant a church, come back, rest a while. He did this for a long time. He did it about 20 years with Polycarp and another 20 years after he got out of prison. Our apostles, yes, getting out of prison, tells you what we may end up doing here in the near future. So anyway, so he does this, and he ends up dying uh, and is buried in, in Ephesus. Polycarp later on is, is uh, martyred. Polycarp's disciple, main disciple, is this guy, Irenaeus. So Irenaeus is saying, hey, I was there. I know these things. So he has a disciple, the guy on the left, the little Catholic guy, you know, or, yeah, you're, you're right, I should say. Anyway, his name is Hippolytus. The Hippolytus went on to go to Rome. There was a, uh, a bishop there, the bishop, pope, whatever you want to call him, Callistus, who began to do some very wicked things. And so Hippolytus said, this stops, and this stops now. And he led kind of a rebellion. And he was getting to the pope. He may have, uh, the point that he may have ousted that pope and become another pope, except there was a persecution 
All the popes, all the leaders get banished to an island, and he ends up dying there. So he's officially in Catholic circles called an antipope. He probably would have been a pope of Rome had it not been for another persecution. Now the other guy on the other side is Ephraim the Syrian. And I bring these up because this is interesting to me. You basically, you've got, before we had Protestant, Catholic, East Orthodox type people, you've got Irenaeus. You've got the person that would be a very strong Roman Catholic, Hippolytus, and a very strong Eastern Orthodox theologian. Now, as, as you know, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestants teach different things today about prophecy. What's interesting is we look at their writings, they all say the same thing. So later on in time, the Catholics changed their doctrine, the Eastern Orthodox changed their doctrine. And we can identify from history exactly when that happened. So in the third and fourth century, there was a bishop by the name of Nepos in Egypt that was combating Gnostics. And to make a long story short, he wrote a book called <coughs> Refutation of the Allegorists, in which he said, prophecy is literal, it's not symbolic. But there was a backlash, and the next thing you know, no. We've always taught that it's symbolic, and it means something else. And that's been the party line for well over a thousand years. So, but it's interesting, you go back to the first, second, and beginnings of the third century, and you see consistent doctrine in everything. The gifts of the Spirit, the prophecies, everything. So what I did, I wanted to compile these. Irenaeus writes about prophecy in his book. He wrote a, a five-volume set called Against Heresies. It was against the cults of his day. So he's mainly an anti-cult person. But you know, there's apocalyptic cults. And so he'd run into those and he'd have to write, no, no, this is what the prophecy means. I know, I was there. You know, John told me, so this is what it means. This cult is wrong. Uh, Hippolytus went and did the same thing. Ephraim just wrote tons and tons and tons of, of commentary on everything. So going on and looking at these, first I want to show you a few things. What we call premillennialism. And that is the idea that we are in the church age. Somewhere in the future, the Lord's going to come back and start a millennial reign. It lasts for a thousand years. You know, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox today, and then some Protestant groups will say that's symbolic. They're amillennialist or postmillennialist, symbolic of something else. Well, here's what the church fathers say, just in general. Here's Papias, another disciple of Polycarp. He says, uh, I was taught by John the Apostle himself that after the resurrection of the dead, Jesus would personally reign for a thousand years. It's not symbolic. Now, this isn't new to you. This is just real basic stuff. But it's neat to see how the church fathers all said the same thing. That's just Papias in, in a fragment, or Papias, depends on how you want to pronounce him. Uh, so here's Irenaeus, uh, the main guy. He says... There's a resurrection of the just that takes place after the destruction of the Antichrist and all the nations that are under his rule. There is a resurrection. There's multiple ones. Many believers will make it through the tribulation and replenish the earth. The resurrection, or in the resurrection, we will have fellowship and communion with holy angels and other spiritual beings. And the new heavens and the new earth are the first created, and then the new Jerusalem descends. I don't know if he's got it in the right order or not, but he's just giving basic uh, chronology here. These are literal things, and Christians who allegorize them are immature Christians. Okay? So basically, the church fathers would say if you're post millennial, if you don't think Jesus is going to come back, or you think the Antichrist and all that stuff was done a long time ago, uh, you're, you don't know your theology properly, and they wouldn't let you preach on, from their pulpit. Now, whether you're pre-mid or post-trib rapture, that's one subject that it's a little debatable. So that's not something we divide over, although prophecy dictated we would end up dividing over it. But that's one point. So when Jesus comes back, does he do this first or that first? I don't know. We'll see. But he comes back, and that's the main thing he's talking about here. I just thought this was fascinating. Immature Christians. So premillennialism, if you study the early church fathers, is very... Uh, specific, and we know for sure that's what they meant. He says in another place, when in the end the church will be suddenly, suddenly caught up from this, and that's when it said that there will be tribulation such as not been since the beginning nor shall be. So he apparently is a pre-trib rapturist. Or I guess possibly you could look at this as, as uh, mid, 
but they go up, they come back. So, and there's many reasons why we would say pre-trib, but we didn't want to look specifically at the rapture in this. We want to look at a few other things. Uh, in another place, he says, Daniel the prophet says, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the consummation until many learn and knowledge be completed. That's his paraphrase of that verse in Daniel 11. But notice what he says. What does that mean to him? For at that time when the dispersion shall have been accomplished, right now they've already been kicked out. When the Jews come back, they will know all these things. So he's saying, even in his time, he's writing about 170. The Jews lost their temple uh, 100 years ago, and they've been kicked out about 50 years out of the land. Israel has ceased to exist about 50 years ago at this point. And he's saying sometime the Jews will come back, rebuild their temple, do these things. And when that, when you, when that happens, when you see the Jews come back, the more time that goes by, the more prophecies will be fulfilled, and then you'll know. You wonder what a seven-headed dragon is. Well, at, by that time, you will begin to figure out what that means. What does this symbol mean? Well, when there's five of them and four of them have been fulfilled, you know what it means. So it just gets clearer and clearer. But notice his whole point is sometime the Jews will come back. That happened in 1948. He goes on and says the Roman Empire would first be divided and then dissolved. That happened in history. We'll look at that in a minute. The fourth kingdom seen by Daniel is Rome. That's obvious. We all know that by looking at history. Uh, the rebuilt temple will be in Jerusalem. There's still, I still run into people that will say, well, the temple is symbolic of God in our hearts. It's like, no, it's a group of stones on a certain place, you know, where there's mad people that want to kill us right now. But uh, it, it means exactly what it says. Now, granted... When you see a seven-headed red dragon, that has to be symbolic and mean something. But you're in the book of Revelation. This is a vision or a dream that he's seen. I can tell you some dreams I've had that are weird. Some of them, I think, are actually prophetic. But they're, you, know, it's, you don't see those creatures walking around. So if you have a dream or someone's telling a parable or a vision, it doesn't have to be literal. But when the prophet comes up and says, this is what's going to happen, thus says the Lord, that's literal. So those things are very specific. That's Irenaeus. Oh, one more quote. He says, the ten kings will arise from what used to be the Roman Empire. In his day, Rome was still there. The Antichrist will slay three of these kings or kingdoms. And he will be the eighth among them. The kings will destroy Babylon, that system, and give the Babylonian kingdom to the beast and put the believers to flight. Now, this is a good example here. Somebody will read this and say, he puts the believers to flight. Obviously, he's post-trib. Well, we just read that he's pre, right? He comes before. There's always going to be believers before, during, and after the rapture. Somebody, right? We have the great multitude. So looking for somebody to say <laughs> that there are believers right up until the time of the return doesn't have anything to do with a rapture. So we've got to keep those things straight. You just want to look and see if he ever talks about a pre-trib rapture or a mid-trib rapture or something like that. After that, he says, after the, the middle of the tribulation as we know it, when the Antichrist starts that major persecution, he says, after that, they will be destroyed by the coming of our Lord. Daniel's horns are the same as the toes in those uh, um, visions that Daniel sees in the book of Daniel. The tolls being part of iron and part of clay means some kings are active and strong, while others in this group are weak and inactive. And the kings will not agree with each other. Sounds very democratic. So, I mean, this is the stuff, if you studied anything with Daniel, this is all easy to understand. But this is a guy back in 170 saying, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, Rome's still here. Yeah, Jews are still around, but this is what's going to happen. Now, here's the epistle of Barnabas. That's a companion of Paul. He wrote the epistle early on. It talks a lot about typological prophecy and these things, and we try to bring these back so you guys can get them and read them. But here's what he says. This is kind of interesting at one point, talking about the prophecy of uh, Israel being destroyed by Rome or that fourth, fourth kingdom in Daniel. He says, this prophecy was fulfilled because the Jews went to war against their enemy, and they were not supposed to. 
But even though they are now no more than servants of Rome, they will return and rebuild their temple. And it was revealed in prophecy that the city of Jerusalem and the temple and the people were to be given up. Micah 4 talks about the plowing of Jerusalem. Daniel um, 9 talks about the destruction of the temple, Daniel 11. And the people being dispersed is, is again in Micah and several other places. So the prophecies are pretty specific that this would happen. And since they were specific and the first part happened, obviously the second part happens. Someone asked in one of the epistles, Irenaeus, do you think that the Christians will rebuild the temple? I mean, maybe we'll make Rome the Christian empire and then we'll rebuild the temple. And he just said, well, the temple gets rebuilt and Christians don't sacrifice in temples. So what's that tell you? He wouldn't kind of take sides at the moment, but it's just like, who? it wouldn't be Muslims. Of course, there weren't any at the time, but obviously the Jews return. And he's saying that here, the Jews will return and rebuild their temple. Obvious to us, but people will say in the first, second century, everybody was anti-Semitic. No, early Catholic fathers were anti-Semitic. That's third, fourth, and fifth centuries. First, second, and third centuries are basically Protestants, like we would say. Now, here's Irenaeus also talking about the premillennialism. He says in the second Thessalonians, Paul's second epistle, where he talks about the falling away. He said that's an apostasy and that there would be a literal rebuilt temple. So somewhere along the line, the church in general becomes messed up. And he doesn't say a whole lot at this point, but there's an apostasy. Somebody, apparently the Jews, come back and rebuild the temple. In Matthew, and it's in chapter 24, but he didn't give that. Just in the book of Matthew, he says that abomination spoken of by Daniel is the Antichrist sitting in the temple as if he were Christ. The abomination will start in the middle of Daniel's 70th week and last for a literal three years and six months. That little horn or the 11th horn mentioned by Daniel is the Antichrist. Now, again, some, some groups talk about that's all been fulfilled. That was all fulfilled by 70 AD. Well, this is 170 AD saying, no, no, it hasn't been fulfilled yet. The first part was, the second part's not. It's yet future. Now, here's some interesting things about the beginning of the millennial reign that they taught, and then we'll get into some real specifics. Um, Bar the Epistle of Barnabas says that, therefore, children, in six days, or in 6,000 years, all the prophecies will be fulfilled. When it says that he rested on the seventh day, this signifies that at the second coming of our Lord Jesus, he will destroy the Antichrist, judge the ungodly, change the sun, moon, and stars, and then he will truly rest during the millennial reign, which is the seventh day. So they had a consistent teaching that the Sabbath was a type of our time period. We'd have 6,000 years of human history in a millennial reign, which is very consistent. Not just this, but let's just go on and look at these. Here's Irenaeus saying, the day of the Lord is like a thousand years and the six days he created and all things were completed. So it's evident, therefore, that things will come to an end in the 6,000th year. The Sabbath is a type of a future kingdom. Doesn't mean they did or did not keep the Sabbath, but the symbolism behind these things. For a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. That's a quote from Peter. Since then, the six days the Lord created all things, it follows then that in 6,000 years all things will be fulfilled. And that's from Hippolytus. So we've got Barnabas, Irenaeus, Hippolytus. Here's Commodius. We will be immortal when the 6,000 years are completed. So all of you guys that are going in the rapture, be it pre mid or post, or you die along the way or whatever, during, at the resurrection, we'll all be immortal. And that will happen at the 6,000 years. Again, if we had the calendar absolutely perfect, we could probably try to pinpoint some of these things. <laughs> now, it's wrong to say that you, the Lord's told you certain things like this when he said he's not going to tell you certain things. But a lot of people speculate, and I'm just trying to speculate on everything to try to pull things together. And this is their consistent teaching. The Lord came and, and fulfilled the prophecies in 32 AD. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 years later, we would have a second coming. And there's got to be a rapture seven years prior to that, in the tribulation period and these things. Commodius also says the resurrection of the body will be when the 6,000 years are completed 
And after 1,000 years, that would be the millennial reign, the world will come to an end, new heavens and new earth. So again, this is the same stuff that we're all taught, but it's nice to see the early guys teaching this. Here's uh, Victor, uh, Victor Anas. He actually wrote the, what's currently the oldest commentary on the book of Revelation, about 240. He says Satan will be bound until the thousand years are finished. After that, that's after the sixth day. So again, he's telling you these things. The seventh millennium, will, we will be immortal and truly celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Hallelujah. It's Methodius. So it's another one of the guys basically all saying the same thing. Lactanus, one of my favorite guys, getting a little further up there. The 6,000th year is not yet complete. There were some Greek manuscripts that made it up to like 5,500 when Jesus was here. Those are kind of messed up. He's saying, no, no, it can't be complete because when this number is complete, the consummation must take place. It's like when somebody says, I think the rapture already happened. Wait a minute. Ow. No, it didn't. I'm still here. (laughs) Kind of making fun of people. It's just like, no, I'm still here. More prophecies. So that's their concept. So, so far we have from Irenaeus, the basic idea of uh, premillennialism and that the, ra- the second coming is in the year 6,000, whenever that is. And again, one of the things we looked at this morning was uh, Jesus came probably about 2 BC, died when he was 33 and a half, which is 32 AD, more or less. And if we're talking about when he came, plus 2,000 years, would have been 1998, And guess what? It didn't happen. Not in 1998. But he came to fulfill a prophecy in 32 AD. And the second time he comes, the prophecy is to create a millennial reign, which is probably the same year. So I'm thinking 2,000 years after 32 AD would be 2032, which is, what, 13 years away? Minus a seven-year tribulation? I think we're getting close. And hopefully... My numbers are way off, and it's tomorrow. (laughs) But you never know. So that's what they're saying about this. So let's look at this. This is the the new book that we released, so it's got these three. We have a basic understanding of prophecy, and what we wanted to do is reproduce three books that these guys wrote. Uh, Ephraim, the Syrian, wrote The End Times. Uh, Hippolytus wrote a book called The Antichrist, and also one called The End of the World. And we recreated them in this book. It's not very long. Ancient books are like, you know, 10 pages. They're real small usually. Uh, Ephraim has 10 chapters. Uh, Hippolytus' Antichrist has 60 chapters. It's the big one. End of the world only has 40. So really interesting. You may have heard people talk about pseudo-Ephraim. And it's very clearly a pre-trib rapture document. Very, very clearly. And they say, well, it's pseudo-Ephraim. Ephraim didn't really write it. It was fake. Well, somebody wrote it. So somebody back then believed in a pre-trib rapture. So that kind of blows away the Darby idea. But why is it called pseudo-Ephraim? Well, pseudo means false or dubious, okay? And it could mean that we think the book is really weird. In this case, no. Everybody accepted the book and its teachings. The author is dubious. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Probably Paul. Some of the church fathers said it might have been Barnabas. I guess we're not absolutely sure. But it was by the power of the Holy Spirit put into the canon, so it's something we want to study. But we don't know who wrote it necessarily. So in this case, the church fathers, there's three church fathers that mention the book uh, specifically, say it's a great book, but two of them say it was written by Ephraim the Syrian, and one says it was written by Isidore of Seville. So it's most likely two-thirds of vote, written by Ephraim. It could be Isidore. If it was two for Isidore and one for Ephraim, we'd be talking about this work as the pseudo-Isidore work. So does that make sense? We're not sure who wrote it. But nobody really debates that the text is legitimate from that time period. And somebody wrote it, so somebody back there believed in a pre-trib rapture and a lot of other things. And that's what's amazing to me. Everybody knows it. You're either for it or against it because it's pre-trib. What else does it say? I don't know. Never looked. You know, it's amazing to me we, we do that kind of a thing. So we look at these things. So what I'm going to do is go through and some of the charts. You know I love charts on these. 
I'm just going to give it to you and then tell you basically what it says in the book or in their books. So here's Irenaeus' outline of end time events. He says, first, the church will apostatize. Didn't really say a whole lot about what that is, but the church fathers, if you want to study that, actually give quite a bit of information, uh, about 100 points on what the church should be doing, but at that time will be doing something like this instead. So it's really interesting. Uh, the Antichrist is born from the tribe of Dan. You've probably heard that. Now, I've always scratched my head because we, we're not sure if he's a Muslim, a Jew, a Christian, some combination of the other. And, you know, he comes from something like that probably. And there's New Age Christians, there's New Age Muslims, there's New Age Jews, there's the Kabbalah and those type of things. But somehow he's, he's from the tribe of Dan. Now, what's interesting of this is they all say that. <clears throat> and I had to go past Irenaeus into Ephraim and Hippolytus to figure out what they meant because they all teach that. But suppose he is born, from, he's a descendant of Dan. I don't know where the Danites are, so that doesn't really help me figure anything out. So there's got to be more to it than just that, unless, of course, in the right time, all the Danites are found and they go somewhere or whatever. So the thing is, though, and this is really interesting, this is the way Hippolytus described it. <clears throat> there's a prophecy that says Jesus would be born a descendant of Judah. Remember that prophecy? And he was. You go back all the way through David, which goes all the way back through Judah. So that's his, his uh, genealogy, his line. Okay. There's also a prophecy that he would be born uh, in Bethlehem. Okay. Now, this is really interesting if you think about this. The temple is in the area of Benjamin. Okay. And Bethlehem is just right, it's like six miles from where the, it used to be, is in the area of Judah. So if he was born in Jerusalem, you could say he's born of the tribe of Benjamin. Maybe he's not descended by it, but he's in that tribal area. Well, he was born in, the tri in, ben in Bethlehem, so that would be the tribe of Judah. Now it talks about another prophecy says that the, re the region of Gad and Zebulun, I believe, or Naphtali, Zebulun and Naphtali, light springs up, okay? So Jesus would start his ministry in the area of those two. Well, you go look and see where those two, it's around the area of Galilee. And where did he start his, his ministry? Out of Capernaum, Peter's home, that area, that was his headquarters. So we're talking about the land of where they used to be. So if you go back and you say, okay, he's, a he's not basically a descendant of Dan, but he's from the tribe of Dan. Where is or where was the tribe of Dan located? Well, they were right there by the coast of Tel Aviv, you know, down in that area. For a little while, the Philistines gave them a major problem, and then they moved north up to Tel Dan, up to the Golan Heights area, and things happen. Now, there's other prophecies that the church fathers quote that talks about Dan is a lion's whelp and an adder that bites, and he bites from baby. And so the church fathers put this together and said, well, it's not that he's a Danite. When he is born, he's going to be born in the area of the Golan Heights, in Bashan. That's the old name for that. So right now, that area of Tel Dan, there's a piece of it that's in, this may not help much, but there's a piece of it that's in Lebanon, in northern Israel, and in Syria. So if he's born in Syria, I'm assuming he's Muslim, but he could be anywhere in that area. But we're told that he's coming from there. And it's interesting because Daniel 11 says he's the king of the north. So he's the president or dictator or something of that 11th horn, which is a kingdom north of Israel. So it's not the United States. We're not north of Israel. So it's not Barack Obama. And I, I double-checked. I looked for Barack Obama and Barack Obama in Greek and in Hebrew. None of them equals 666, so we're okay. <laughs> but still, it's not north of Israel. So this is fascinating because I'd looked at these things and always wondered. Now, the church fathers could be wrong. It might mean something else. Just like my theories might mean something else, I could be wrong. But I like to pull these together. These are guys that have been right on with everything else so far. 2,000 years ago, telling us exactly what would happen. And I think you've, you've seen the timeline prophecies where we can actually look and see the date the Messiah was supposed to be put to death. And it was supposed to be April 
sixth, I think, 32 AD. And the timeline prophecy says that Israel would come back into their land, and it was supposed to be May 4th, on our calendar, it was supposed to be May 14th, 1948. Sure enough, they were decreed to be a nation at that point. So some of the prophecies are given, and they're given dates. The dates are set, and they are absolutely perfect. You've got to be careful with setting dates, though. People think you're a cult because most of the cults do that. Most of us don't. But still, the, the whole concept is that date setting is normal. The exception to the rule is the rapture because we don't know because it specifically says that. So anyway, he says, the church apostatizes, the Antichrist will be born of the tribe of Dan. The rapture of the church would occur. The rebuilding of the temple will occur. The ten nations will seek to destroy Babylon. That says that in Revelation. The Antichrist sets up a desolating abomination in the midst of the temple. The ten nations persecute believers of that time. Then there's a second coming. Then there's the establishment of the millennial reign and the building of a millennial temple. So that's his outline. So other than the Dan part, you probably all knew all of that, but it's really interesting just to see those. Okay, Ephraim's outline. This is where it gets really interesting. This is the one, pseudo Ephraim, that says, you know, pre-trib rapture. What else does it say? And he says, first, the nation of Israel should be dissolved. That's what the prophecy said. That happened in 132. And then the Roman Empire would be divided. He doesn't say where he gets this. They usually don't, but it's probably in Daniel's statue. And I've often thought about this. You've got Babylon, the head of gold. The chest and arms are Medio Persia, Medes and Persians. That's why I got two arms, Medes and Persians. And then a belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron being the Roman Empire, two legs, Eastern and Western Rome when it splits. Pretty interesting. And that's made me stop and think, well, Instead of having 10 nations in Europe or 10 nations in the Middle East or 10 nations somewhere, could we have five on one toe, one foot, and five on... Unless, the, unless it's a weird-looking statue, he should have five toes on each foot. So do we have five European nations and five Middle Eastern nations? That would fit the, the concept. It would be almost impossible with Muslims. Of course, some are warlike and some are dominant and some are not, so... But then we see Islam beginning to invade Europe, and now there's a backlash. So interesting to watch current events. But then he prophesied a Christian empire would form. Out of the, one of those legs becomes a Christian empire. And that happened in 395. On these charts, the, the things in the square brackets are the chapters. So if you want to know where he said that, you can go back to chapter 1, section B, and read it real careful and see if there's something else I'm missing. So, uh, Christian Byzantine Empire would form. The Western Empire would then dissolve. That happened in 476. Then there would be a Byzantine-Persian war, wars between the Christian Empire and ancient Persia. That actually happened. I wasn't really aware of it, but those wars were between 602 and 628 A.D., now, how does a guy three to four hundred years before this accurately predict this unless he knows something, you know? And again, church fathers, especially back in the early times, even if you think the gifts of the Spirit died out, fine. People in the first century had the gifts of the Spirit. Remember Agabus in the book of Acts was a prophet? He may or may not have written what he saw down. So it's something to look at. This guy was accurate, unless, of course, it's been tampered with, which is always a possibility. You always got to take it with a grain of salt. Then this Christian Byzantine Empire would be overtaken. It was destroyed in 1453 by Muslim conquest. And that was the great Ottoman Empire that we finally destroyed in 1917. So very, very interesting. It's really interesting to me because he gets real specific about this. He talks about how two brothers would come up. And one would take the eastern part of the empire and one would take the western part of the empire and they would do it as brothers because it's just flat too big to rule. But then something would happen. One would get jealous of another and they would become independent. And I've looked all the way through trying to figure out where in the world he got that information. It was correct. You can actually identify the two brothers of, uh, of uh, Caesar Honorus, I think, of that time period, 395. 
finally found it in an ancient scroll. So we'll be talking about that later because it's got some other interesting things. Again, it's neat when you see a church father say, oh, well, I know the answer to that one because it's in the book of Enoch. Oh, I know that one because it's in Revelation. Well, I'm sure he holds Revelation higher than Enoch, but they just talk about stuff like that. Am amazing to look at. But this was supposed to happen. Then the desert peoples become totally senseless, killing everything that moves. They're just like, like they're nuts or animalistic or something. We see that with Islam. I don't know which desert peoples he's talking about, but that's what it uh, specifically says. And then the Antichrist would be born in the Golan. Interesting. He actually comes out and says it that way. Same thing Irenaeus hinted at. The Golan, the Golan Heights, ancient uh, Bashan, where the tribe of Dan moved. He's from the tribe of Dan or from the area of the tribe of Dan. And then these ten worthless nations arise. Absolutely worthless. <laughs> Cause a lot of problems. And then the seven years begins. That's all supposed to happen before the seven years. The rapture of the church, he makes that very clear. He's probably the clearest out of all the, the texts, Ephraim. And then the Antichrist craftily takes the kingdom. The Antichrist appeases the Jews by reinstituting circumcision. This one kind of confused me. And now, religious people do circumcision, but in this country and in Israel, if you say, absolutely not, you're not cutting on my baby boy, they will, uh, okay, fine. So they will allow you to make that choice, but it's still kind of standard. Under the Mosaic law, no, no, it's going to happen. That's the law. And so this kind of thing getting reinstituted. There is a, a um, prophecy in Daniel 11 uh, and you probably remember this one, about the Antichrist will not regard the desire of women. And I've often thought, does that mean he's a homosexual? Does that mean he's just not sexual at all? Or he denigrates women, treats them like they're dirt? You know, which is like Muslim type stuff. Or, you know, it could mean a bunch of stuff. But if you'll notice, it's talking about religious things because he's talking something about God and he doesn't regard the, the regard of women and then he doesn't do this and he doesn't do that. So it's all religious God stuff all put together. So it's odd to have that in there if it's just he denigrates women or he's a homosexual or something. It has to, looks like it's something religious. Somehow Ephraim connects these two and he says that scripture means that circumcision will be brought back. And I don't know how that connects. He didn't explain why. So, and he could be wrong, of course. But it's really interesting how they kind of interpret these things. Uh, Enoch and Elijah would testify. Uh, the Antichrist wars occur. He mentions Psalm 83. And according to what they taught, Psalm 83 is that, that group of, of nations that hate Israel, and they keep invading, and they keep invading, and they keep invading. And once and for all, will you please destroy these people? And that happens at this time, according to the way he's reading it. Mentions that Ammon and Moab surrender to the Antichrist first. He's talking about the Antichrist wars in the, in the first part of the seven years. And the Antichrist slays the two witnesses. Then the temple sacrifices are stopped. The abomination is set up. The mark of the beast is implemented. Then the second coming of the Messiah, the destruction of the Antichrist in his kingdom, and Christ's millennial reign occurs. And that's basically the way Ephraim's outline takes it. Very, very interesting. So here's Hippolytus from his first work about the Antichrist. And he basically says this. First, Jerusalem would be destroyed by Rome, and it was. That was 70 AD, and then in 71 AD, the city was plowed under. Um, the Antichrist would be born of the circumcision. If that's true, he's a Christian Jew or Muslim, or his family is Christian Jew or Muslim. Kind of interesting. It doesn't mean a whole lot, but... Um, if he claims to be the perfect, and I've often thought about that, I am the Messiah. Okay, Jews will accept me. I am the second coming. I am the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Okay, the Christians will accept me. I am the Mahdi prophesied. Okay, Muslims will accept me. You know, I am the second Krishna. Well, the Hindus accept me. He's going to say that to everybody. Remember, he is a liar. So all these things are going to come together. <clears throat> He's supposed to be born of the tribe of Dan. He restores the Roman Empire. Now, of course, we understand that. This one actually says from four pieces. 
So that would be interesting to figure out. I, I don't know if he's mixing up the four pieces of the Greek kingdom, which were in the Roman Empire, or that's a clue to figure out who these people are we're talking about. But it's very interesting. And notice that I've always, in my studies over the years, I've looked at the Western Roman Empire, and I've looked at its height, how far it ever went, the whole, and then looked at all those nations. So we figure out what nations could be out of the ten. I forgot all about the fact that it fragmented and there was a Byzantine Christian Empire over here. So we need to look at all the area they had and compare the two because that might we might be missing something. Um, so anyway, he says this, and when the seven years begin, he, there will be a rapture of believers. Again, this is amazing that they all agree on this stuff. The Antichrist raises up a Jewish kingdom now, the, Israel's already there, but the way they're describing it is, and it's similar to Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. They come back together, but they have no breath. So right now, it's a secular kingdom, but somehow the Antichrist will turn it into a Jewish religious kingdom. Kind of interesting. Um, Jesus kind of sort of said the same thing when he said that the, if you see the abomination of desolation run, and pray that it not be on a Sabbath. Why? I can still get a taxi. Not if those Sabbath laws were reinstituted and mandatory, you wouldn't. Well, who's going to do that? The Sanhedrin. There is no Sanhedrin. It's an Israeli secular government. 2004, the Sanhedrin was reborn. And people said it's 70 old guys that nobody will pay attention to. They have no power. What is power? It's when people pay attention and do what you tell them. There's a lot now, it's been over 10 years, there's a lot of secular Noahides and religious Jewish people that will say, I don't care what you, what did the Supreme, I don't care what the Supreme Court said, what did the Sanhedrin say about it? And that's growing in power. If it ever gets really powerful, the government won't matter or they'll make a compromise or something. So it's interesting to see that as, as predicted by Jesus, the Sanhedrin's back. 2004. Then there will be uh, uh, Antichrist builds the Jerusalem temple or has it built. Enoch and Elijah, he says those are the two. I don't know if they come in the spirit and power of Enoch and Elijah or whoever, but they witness for 1260 days doing those miracles in the temple. And then during this time, the Antichrist wars begin where he goes and conquers all the neighboring areas before he comes to, to Israel. Jordan is the first to submit they don't go to war. They simply submit. Okay? Tyre and Beirut are the first to fall. They resist the Antichrist and fall. I thought it was interesting. Beirut's the capital of Lebanon, so that makes sense. Tyre would be with them, but there's actually a prophecy that says before this happens, Israel has a Lebanese war, and they take southern Lebanon, and they have to keep it for some reason. I think it's because people that have missiles that finally get guidance system on their missiles have to be stopped when they're firing rockets down at you from a mountain. But this happens, and it actually mentions in, in Obadiah and in Zephaniah where the new border would be. It's Seraphon, Lebanon, will be the new border of Israel. That puts Tyre technically in Israeli territory. And I thought that was interesting because it says, well, that'll fall both Beirut and Tyre. That whole area falls to the Antichrist. And then the Antichrist destroys three kingdoms. And they get this out of the, the ten nations and the, the talk about that in Daniel 11. In Daniel 11, it says that there, he does the peace covenant. Egypt says, over my dead body, you will, and attacks. And he goes down and destroys Egypt. And then the text, my text says, Libya and Ethiopia are at his feet or at his steps. I have no idea what that means. Are they like with him attacking Egypt? Or are they with Egypt attacking him? Or they just come in afterwards for the spoil? They're involved somehow. Ephraim, Hippolytus, and Irenaeus say it means that Egypt, Libya, and northern Ethiopia, which is Sudan, are the three nations of, of the ten nations that go against what the Antichrist is and attack. So we are told then three of these ten nations. You might remember the prophecy in um, Isaiah 18. It's specifically talking about 
the Ethiopia that's beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. It's a riddle. Back in those times, Ethiopia was everything south of Egypt. Later on, the prophet knew it would break up into two pieces. There'd be Sudan and Ethiopia that's further south, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Usually your rivers are in the middle of your country. Now it's at the side. It's uh, one of those prophecies, one of those riddles. So he says specifically then, the Antichrist would destroy Egypt, Libya, and Sudan. Those are the three countries that the Antichrist destroys. I don't know if they are or not, but it's really interesting that we have more than one person that was taught by people who were taught by the apostles that say this is what they were taught and it's consistent. Temple sacrifices will be stopped. The abomination sets up. It lasts for 1,290 days. Persecution of believers begins. And then eventually there's a millennial reign. Very, very in interesting. Now from his second, the outline from his second book, and this is all in, in the book, so you can go back and, like again in the brackets, look at chapter 3 and chapter 5 and 6. The church will apostatize. And we'll describe that later. There'll be weather extremes. False Christ will appear. Antichrist will be born from the tribe of Dan. Again, that was very consistent among everybody. Assumably, that means Golan. The Antichrist is born of the circumcision, so he's a Christian Jew Muslim. Somebody or somebody that, uh, I guess it's just those three. Uh, he says he's of Jewish descent. And he says that he's virgin born. I thought it was really interesting. They highlighted that. That's what he says, or he will say. He claims to love Israel more than any other nation. Yeah, right. And then the seven years starts. And in this outline, he talks about the two witnesses preaching for 1260 days, the Antichrist restoring the kingdom of the Jews, the religious kingdom. He's destroying Egypt, Libya, and Sudan. It's mentioned again in a different book, so that's interesting. Antichrist builds the Jerusalem temple, or has it built. He stops the temple sacrifices. The persecution of believers begin. He creates a mark to cause people to, uh, to control them so they can't buy or sell without it. Then there's a second coming and the destruction of the Antichrist and his empire. So it's really, really fascinating. So we have a few extra minutes here. So here's a master outline in the back of the book. So again, you can go back and look at these things. To pull all these together, the church father said, this is the way everything goes down, and in this order. Now, I'm not sure how they got it, but this is what they say they were taught by the apostles. First, Jerusalem is destroyed. That was 70 AD. The nation of Israel would be dissolved. That would be 132. The Roman Empire is divided with those two brothers. That was in 395. A Christian empire forms. That was in 395. The Western Roman Empire dissolves. That was in 476. And then desert peoples become senseless. I am assuming that's the rise of Islam. Then the Byzantine-Persian Wars. The Christian nation at war with Persia. That was 602 to 628. And then the Christian Byzantine Empire is overtaken by some probably senseless nations. And we saw that. That was in 1453. And then the church, somewhere, sometime after that, the church in general, apostatizes. And part of those things are false Christ would come. I'm Jesus. I'm the reincarnation of Jesus. I'm channeling Jesus. Something to do with Jesus. False Christ. Gnosticism would return. Now, if you've studied any of the Gnostic cults, you can see the cults are full of Gnostic ideas. Some parts of our church are, have Gnostic ideas. The very roots of Calvinism and Roman Catholicism are from Gnostic ideas. Not just those, but I mean, lots of things are that way. Incantations and sorcery become common in the church. An incantation is when I say, you, go. A prayer is when I say, would you please help me with this? It's totally different. So when I invoke an angel or invoke God, and I say, you will do this, like a word of faith movement, it's an incantation. When I do a real prayer, Lord, I'm stuck. I need help. Please, that's a prayer. Sorcery is meditation. So whether I use contemplative prayer or transcendental meditation or some sort of uh, drug or some sort of electronic device to get my mind in a different state where I see visions and see things and think of things, 
That's sorcery. That's something that's forbidden. We mentioned this morning that the, the groups that always practice sorcery or meditation uh, are like Hindus and Buddhists. And a lot of times, after they meditate for a long time, they get to the idea that they are God somehow. Really interesting. Immorality becomes common. I think we're there. The study of prophecy is forsaken. Remember what Enoch said this morning? It's a sin to ignore prophecy and refuse to study it. Oh, I'll get to it later. Okay, and you'll get to being moral and quit drinking later. It's a sin. The study of prophecy does get forsaken, though. The nation of Israel would be reborn. We've seen that in 1948. And then pre-temple sacrifices would begin. How many of you know that started in 2014? The pre-temple sacrifices. Yeah, it's another prophecy we've seen in our lifetime. And then weather extremes. The Antichrist born of the tribe of Dan again. Circumcision. Antichrist says he's of Jewish descent, born of a virgin, loves Israel. Uh, the worthless ten nations arise. The rapture of the church. The Antichrist craftily takes the kingdom. The two witnesses preach for 1260 days. The Antichrist rises up a religious Jewish kingdom. Kind of an apostate religious system in the government. The Antichrist appeases the Jews, possibly by reinstituting circumcision. The Antichrist wars occur finally. Psalm 83 will not be repeated. Finally done. The people hide in the rocks from the wars. Ammon and Moab surrender to the Antichrist first. Tyre and Beirut fight against him but fall. And then the Antichrist destroys Egypt, Libya, and Sudan, three of the ten nations. And the Antichrist restores the Roman Empire. That needs further study. Four pieces I don't understand. Uh, Jerusalem Temple will be quickly built at that point. Ten nations destroy Babylon. The Antichrist slays the two witnesses. The temple sacrifices are stopped. The abomination is set up. The mark of the beast implemented. And the ten nations persecute the believers. So it's really interesting. And that's three of the church fathers that wrote books or extensive studies on prophecy. The rest of them will make comments here and there and pretty much agree with all these. That's pretty much my presentation. I want you to know that we've got books on prophecy and uh, the fallen angels, ancient paganism to learn what the ancient pagan religion was, how the Antichrist uses it, the teaching of the church fathers. And we've got our studies out there on the book of Enoch and uh, the uh, DVD series Gary and I did on the studies on the book of Enoch. So this book is out there, The Ancient Times by the Church Fathers. We've also got two DVDs on prophecy. The first one is the prophetic timeline that tells you the, the dates of 32 AD, 1948, 1967, how we do the math, see those timeline prophecies fulfilled in the church age. So thank you very much. I hope this has been enlightening, and I hope we all continue to study.